So, hey, Jason, I got to tell you, I'm really excited about today's episode. I, I was teaching a class and they had a problem at one of their remote locations where the network utilization at, at peak periods of the day was actually quite high. So I helped them set up uh, QoS on their firewall to be able to spot, you know, some of the, the peaks and valleys and the bandwidth graph. And we found something interesting that I'm excited to tell you about in today's episode. Now, in addition to that, I want to go and, and illuminate for the folks a little bit more about quality of service. It's a term that's been around for a long time, but not every one of us understands it maybe in the same way. So I want to do a level set and a deep dive. Hang on. No, no, no. That word's overused. I'm going to do a high jump over your typical QoS hurdles, and we're going to learn something awesome today. Fantastic. In this episode, Mitch is going to take us into quality of service, a high jump over those QoS obstacles. Some of you may not even know that the firewall could do QoS. Well, stay tuned for a thorough, comprehensive look at QoS. This is Learning Happy Hour with your hosts, Mitch Densley and Jason Yates. It's time to learn, laugh, and chat cybersecurity. BYOB, bring your own brain. Cheers! Has your network ever been slow? And if it has, what do you do about it? Do you just ignore it? Or yell at everyone and act like it's everyone else's fault for using the network? Or do you blame your ISP and pretend like there's nothing you can do about it? Or do you wish you could identify who was hogging all your network speed and throttle the crap out of them? Well, guess what? You can do it. And that's the focus of our topic today. But before we get into that, Jason, what you drinking today? Just I am plenty. very much a hardcore coffee drinker. Yeah? Right. Yes. Oh, that's Pacific it. Northwest, Seattle Seahawks, coffee. I, like if I was in a car accident and... It was one of those really kind of gory car accidents. Uh, I would bleed coffee. I'm pretty sure about that. I'd be like caffeinated all over the, the asphalt. That's what would happen. Let's talk you know, about how to spot bandwidth hogs and throttle them. That's what we're here to talk about. Now, ask yourself, have you seen this before? This is like, no joke, my home internet. Um, I had to cut off the ISP just to protect the, I don't want to say innocent, but to protect them. This is a problem. And I'll be honest with you, my marriage was in danger because the spouse and I are gamers and we have a very slow internet connection. Oh so my gosh, yeah. That. Yeah, we fixed that by getting a Palo Alto Networks firewall and implementing quality of service. Now, a lot of people think that quality of service is hard to implement and hard to maintain. Like, as hard as changing a tire. Actually, it's way easier than all of that. And now I'm really excited over doing this, Mitch, because cause I know, because, you know, I've seen your QoS configuration. It's awesome. And I know that QoS is one of those features that we don't often talk about in terms of the firewall. Like, well, you know, we talk about app ID and we talk about threat prevention, which is the primary job of the firewall is to do all that cybersecurity stuff. But then there is this kind of like a, a secret uh, that you should know about. Uh, what do they call that? I don't know. A secret you should know about. And <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Well, what did they, they call it? Like, uh, uh, anyway. The, yeah, well, no, there's a phrase that people use sometimes about um, features that are like the, the, the most unknown, well-known. I don't know. But the point is, I, I'm excited about this. I appreciate that, Jason. Uh, your enthusiasm is 100% warranted because what we're about to show you, as I said, is easy and very effective. Now, to a point you made earlier about the, the cybersecurity aspects of quality of service, there's not a one-to-one -one direct linkage. However, you can start to use the capabilities that are built around QoS to learn patterns of behavior that several users in your network may be taking. So I couple QoS with reporting to be able to spot not just bandwidth hogs, but maybe even identify why a person may be hogging the bandwidth uh, and, and you can take steps then to, to mitigate that. Or maybe that person goes on a watch list if they're trying to exfiltrate data to some, some malicious destination, right? And it, it floats to the top very easily when you use the reporting tools like the ACC, customer reports, 
and even the QoS uh, policy and the QoS uh, interface statistics, which we'll look at. So let's talk about QoS at a high level for just a second. So we're all working from the same baseline understanding. QoS came out of the IEEE. There was a working group that went from 1995 to 1998, and they established the standard 802.1p. It's been updated a little bit since then, but it is the base standard by which QoS is done. The main point of QoS is to prioritize certain type of traffic over other types of traffic that maybe you don't care as much about. The typical implementation of this is for voice traffic, but sometimes also video. I ask, however, why not prioritize more than just voice or video traffic? And the main reason is it's often implemented in what we call an end-to-end -end scenario, where you have to have devices that add their own tag or network equipment that can detect certain types of traffic and then add tags to those different types of traffic. This is typically NBAR. Or at Palo Alto Networks, we use what we call App ID to identify different types of traffic and then assign QoS headers or tags according to the QoS policy. Now, you want to separate traffic that has got QoS headers versus traffic that does not. And so this is often implemented using VLANs to separate that traffic out, trusted or prioritized traffic versus unprioritized traffic. Now also, ISPs, internet service providers, do not like your QoS. Typically, they do their own tagging of traffic based on SLAs or service level agreements you've negotiated with them. But if you do contract for them to respect your QoS tags, or you're using something like MPLS, then you can maintain your QoS tagged infrastructure from one location through the public internet to another location, which is awesome. Talking about a few different terms here, we've got DSCP, Differentiated Services Code Point. This is how we mark packets using DSCP number values, which downstream devices could then look at that number value and independently make decisions whether to prioritize this traffic or to buffer or throttle or even drop this traffic. Marking is the act of assigning these DSCP values to packets. There's a lot of different terms people use interchangeably here. I call it tagging, but marking is the most common term. Metering is how we measure traffic throughput. Policing then is when packets exceed a certain throughput threshold, and then you can drop those offending packets versus shaping, where we actually just buffer packets that burst over a configured threshold, but we don't drop them so that they can be sent again later. Dropping or policing works fine, typically for TCP types of traffic, but for UDP traffic that has no reliability built in, if there's not a layer seven protocol that adds reliability, then when that traffic is dropped, it's just simply gone. Ingress is traffic coming into a device, and then egress is traffic leaving from a device. In order to understand why we need QoS, let's first look at how traffic or data flows through modern networks. And to do this, I borrowed this image, and I think it very appropriately illustrates the differences between local area networks, LANs, that use baseband signaling like Ethernet, versus wide area networks that use some form of broadband signaling, which is an analog signal. And the great thing about broadband is you can multiplex multiple signals together, either using frequency division multiplexing as they're showing here. And there's a bunch of other strategies. This is essentially at the heart of what makes Sprint and Verizon different than T-Mobile and AT&T. But we're focused on the baseband up at the top. And so you can only send a single bit at a single time on a medium, a wire, and that bit will either be a zero or a one. And then megabit versus gigabit is simply how fast can I send those zeros or ones through that same wire in a given amount of time. The key point is notice I cannot send two or more signals in a baseband topology, just a single signal at a time. And as a result, if I need to send two different, let's say files or data transfers across this wire simultaneously, well, one bit has to wait while the other bit gets transmitted. What's nice is our networks are really fast, and so that wait time is measured in nanoseconds or milliseconds if it's being buffered and if it hasn't been dropped. I got an analogy that will help you understand this process. 
But before we get to that, let me just show you how it works out. I've got two, three different file copies. I'm going to start up on Windows 10 here. And you can see as I launch new file copies, the speed of the other two is decreased. Whereas when I pause them, I can go back up to full speed, which according to this is about 45 megabits uh, a second. Let me just play it one more time so you can see how that, that goes. I've got first file copy, 45 megabits a second. I add on a second one, I drop to 22.5 each, which is pretty much half. And then I add a third, and then it further drops the throughput uh, to accommodate you know, all of them running simultaneously. Now, here's a cute example of, of what that's like. Think about your favorite drive-through that has multiple drive lanes. Here we've got two, and notice each car has to zipper itself with the cars from the other lane. And zippering is just the term for you go, I go, you go, I go, you go, I go. And that's exactly how the bits in baseband signaling get prioritized. The benefit of QoS is I could take packets that I want to go through the line faster and give them priority over the packets or the, the traffic that I want to go through the line slower. And for every two cars in line one, I could admit one car in line two. And that's how we do QoS or traffic shaping in modern ethernet networks. So I'm looking at Wireshark right now and you can see there was a DNS request made through my DNS server to the Cloudflare DNS server looking for this connections.brother.com. If I look at the layer three header information, you can see that there's a DSCP value of CS0. So my DNS server didn't tag this traffic or this request anything special. But notice down here is the response from that same Cloudflare server for connections.brother.com. And notice they decided to tag their responses AF22. So I probably should be tagging my requests something similar if my ISP will allow it. Originally, QoS was designed to reference a type of service field built into layer three headers. And that type of service field uh, would be empty or have a zero value by default, indicating that you know this type of traffic is not special, should not be prioritized over any other type of traffic. And that's one option. Or you can put in specific type of service values that then the network infrastructure devices that reference layer three and header information can then prioritize and queue different traffic or prioritize and queue traffic different from each other. That way you get more efficient throughput than just best effort as fast as possible. Now, if you let all types of traffic, it's going to be no different than this dog when the ball is released. He's going to go flat out full speed trying to get between point A and point B where the ball is. So check this out. And here you can see the other dogs like to mess with him. But the white one, Ghost, he's the one who loves to fetch. And watch him go. Full speed as quickly as he can. And that's what we need to try and control. We need to try and avoid certain types of traffic that doesn't need to go full speed from going full speed. So let's see how we would do this. First problem, we've got a user who's hogging all the data, just like Will Ferrell here. He's just, he's going crazy. And that's what we need to fix, all right? That's the so, four food groups right there, man. That is all four food groups very well put. Right. Yeah, so we're gonna candy, find out. Candy canes, candy corn. Maple syrup. syrup. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's one of my favorite Christmas shows. Yeah, I can watch that. the no only Christmas, Christmas show. But yeah, it's great. Okay, so we're gonna figure out who's hogging the data and we're gonna put in the limits to throttle the data hog, all right? Then the problem with, with doing that uh, is you might have some legitimate situations where the hog needs to reuse more bandwidth. So we, I've written a little script that can pull away that throttle on a daily interval. You can obviously call the script as often as you want using cron tab or something like that. Uh, but in my case, I'm just gonna pull it off every 24 hours. All right, uh, and then we need a way to make sure we're only throttling the, the excessive bandwidth type traffic and not throttling legitimate applications like Salesforce or Zoom or, or WebEx, you know, those things because they're real-time video, they can actually eat up a lot of bandwidth. So we wanna carve those out so that we're not blocking uh, legitimate types of traffic, all right? And then we want to have a daily report that we can call up to tell us, you know, is this working the way we expect? 
and also to float you know who those bandwidth hogs are up to the top so that we can identify them and if we need to talk to them okay or we can just put in qs policy rules to further throttle them if desired or needed all right so the solution we've come up with is we're going to identify who those bandwidth hogs are by first starting in the logs the traffic log and we're going to create a filter string that helps us see which sessions have used more traffic than they need to. Then we're gonna implement auto tagging to identify uh, those source addresses and put them into a dynamic address group. Oh, this after is cool. Loads of fun. And after we've done that, then we're gonna match that dynamic address group in a QoS policy rule. And then we're gonna have reports based around that filter string so we can see who's using more than a given amount of data. And then we'll have a script that, that removes those data caps each morning. And then I just throw profit in there because you're going to be a bad A after you implement this and everyone's going to love you for it um, because the whole network is going to feel that much peppier and that much better. I think there's several things in there that um, there, there's some aspects of the firewall that translate into uh, other features, the whole auto tagging and dynamic address group. So let me just, make a shout out that for, for those of you who aren't familiar with what those features are and, uh, and, and don't have much interest in QoS, right? Maybe you're addressing QoS some other way. Um, you, I would encourage you to stay tuned and, and watch carefully because you, you can use auto tagging dynamic address groups and other use cases as well. So this is, this is going to be one example, um, but one that I think will shine a light on the, uh, you know, just the operational power of the firewall uh, using, using DAGs. I completely agree. And I'm glad you brought that up because I made a video. It's, it's been a while now, but it's on our YouTube channel in the live community YouTube channel. Uh, we'll put a link to it down in the show notes at the bottom and it shows you how to use auto tagging dynamic address groups built around, uh, the DNS sinkhole feature and then how to quarantine users using the security policy and then, uh, how to unquarantine users using the URL filtering profile. So a lot of fun things that can be done there. Fairly elaborate scenario, uh, but it's, it's really representative of, of the capabilities or possibilities, which you could then tweak to your individual need or application. All right, so let's walk through the steps that we're going to go through. First, I'm going to show you the steps. Then we're going to look at them each in detail on how to set this up. And then we'll do a little demo after it's all done to show you actually it working right now. So first, you're going to create a log filter string to identify sessions over a certain amount of traffic. Now, because this comes out of the logs, logs are only historical. So this will not interrupt a, a, an existing session that goes above a threshold and then begin to implement uh, QoS throttles on that. If you wanted to accomplish something like that, you could use the XML API and a lot of the components I'm showing you here, but identifying sessions that are active that go over a certain threshold is not something that a log forwarding profile is capable of doing. So you'd need to prompt that using an external bandwidth monitoring tool. But for historical sessions, this will work perfect. All right, then we're going to create a log forwarding profile. And the key part of the reason we're using a log forwarding profile is this will match the source address and assign a tag value, which I'm calling BHOG. And then we'll match that in a dynamic address group. And then that dynamic address group, we're going to uh, couple that with an application filter so we narrow down which app IDs we're going to throttle. And you'll see how I, I pick certain ones. Obviously, how you build your filter is completely up to you. Or you could match on all app IDs and simply in your QoS policy uh, not throttle specific app IDs. It's based on the order of the policy. Then we're going to set up a QoS profile that's going to reference the classes that are defined by the QoS policy. And then we're going to assign those profiles to interfaces where we implement those throttles or those uh, bandwidth caps. Now, one thing to know about our implementation of QoS and Apollo Networks Firewall, we only do egress queuing. We do not do ingress queuing. So when you think about which profile you build, you have to think about which uh, interface that's going to be assigned to for traffic exiting from that interface. And that's an important point to think about, right? Keep that in mind. Egress, not... Ingress. Very good. Yes. That's, it's an easy thing to mix up because other vendors may do ingress queuing. Palatine Network's implementation is only egress. 
Good. And then we're going to create a report that that will run every day. And then you could put that into a report group and email it off to your boss or HR, whomever, if you've got some pretty bad offenders. But otherwise, it's nice to have this report get generated every day so you could go back in time and see on day X, you know, who were the B-hogs during that day and, and so on. All right. And, and then we're going to have a script that will remove these uh, auto tags at, such that traffic would flow at normal rates until somebody violates the threshold the next day. All right, so let's walk through the steps. So first, I'm gonna create a, uh, a scenario where my user is gonna generate a bunch of traffic, and this will go above a certain threshold, and then I'm gonna define that threshold in a log forwarding profile. So we'll just watch the, the traffic flow here for a second till we go over one gigabyte of data transfer. So I've gotten up to two gigabytes now. I'm gonna go ahead and end the session such that now this will create a traffic log entry. If I left this session running, then I would see nothing when I apply this filter string. So what I'm doing is saying whenever the byte count per session goes above or greater than or equal to, and that value there is one gigabit or gigabyte of uh, data transfer. All right, so that's the first thing we're gonna do is identify that session using a filter string. Then we're gonna come over and create a log forwarding profile which will use this uh, filter string and then assign uh, tag values to the source IP addresses that match this filter string. So I'm gonna be looking at the traffic log. I'm gonna paste in the filter string I created a second ago, and whatever you wanna call this rule uh, is, is completely up to you. And then I'm gonna go add that built-in action based on source address. I'm gonna call this bhogs here, and then I'm gonna reference, I'm gonna create a tag value just called bhog. Now I'm creating it right now for the very first time. So after I click okay and okay, I can then uh, later add that log forwarding profile to my security rules so that when traffic, you know, at, uh, facilitated by a given rule goes above a threshold, that bhog tag is added. Now just by doing that, we're not gonna be throttling any traffic. The next thing we need to do is create a dynamic address group that then matches on that bhog tag. And then any source IP address tagged as bhog will be assigned to this dynamically generated address group. And now that it's in an address group, I can then match that in my various policies. Really any policy could match uh, or use this dynamic address group as match criteria. We're gonna focus on the security policy, but as you said earlier, Jason, you could definitely use this in other policies like decryption or the security policy, others, right? So then the next thing we're gonna do is create an application filter to narrow down which app IDs we are going to throttle. So I'm just gonna call this uh, filter bhog apps, and then I'm gonna go first look at the char characteristic of excessive bandwidth, and then I'm speeding up this a little bit so that we save some time, but I'm clicking through other filter criteria uh, to narrow down which app IDs match this uh, filter to start with. And I'm doing this just as a starting point. I encourage you to scroll through the list of app IDs that match the filter you've created, just to make sure that something you really use doesn't sneak through. And the key one I was looking for was FTP. Now eventually, as users generate more traffic, you're gonna wanna, uh, in the QoS policy rule, add additional app IDs, or maybe you would adjust your filter to uh, match on just those that are gonna be excessively using traffic or sending traffic. So I matched my log forwarding profile, my security rule. Now I'm gonna go create my QoS policy rule and I'm gonna create one for now, but you will end up with having several just matching on different types of traffic. So this is gonna say traffic from the inside coming from my bhogs dynamic address group, right? Then uh, it's gonna be destined for the outside, but this could be intra zone, or sorry, um, east-west traffic if you want, between different parts of the data center or different users uh, on VPN connections or whatever, really the source and destination is whatever you want it to be. So now I'm gonna go ahead and assign these bhogs to class seven. And all class seven is, think of it like a line at Disneyland. In Disneyland, you really got two lines, right? There's the normal line and then there's the fast pass line. And if they've invented new lines since I've been there, uh, I'm unaware, right? But we have up to seven different lines or classes that we can define within a Palo Alto Networks firewall. 
Traffic that is unclassified, meaning it does not match a QoS policy rule, will automatically be classified as class four. So four is the default class. So that gives you three classes above the default and uh, five classes beneath the default for, or sorry, four classes beneath the default for, for matching different traffic and assigning thresholds. So now I'm gonna go to the network tab, the QoS section, uh, and I'm gonna create a QoS profile first. There is the default. I'm gonna create my own, and eventually I will have two of these QoS profiles, but first, I'm gonna create one for my download traffic and I'm gonna take every class and give them various priorities. And then the bottom three classes, six, seven, and eight, I'm gonna assign some uh, egress maximums. So these are your throttles uh, or your, your, your egress thresholds, okay? So I've created that QS profile. I'll come back later and create another one for upload, but notice this one is just focused on download. So if I think about my firewall, I've got a given interface that uh, sends traffic that came in from the internet to my users, and then I have another interface that takes traffic from my users and sends it to the inter internet. So ETH11 is my outside interface, ETH12 is my inside interface, and so I'm gonna match my download profile for ETH12. Now I'm gonna go create another one uh, called Upload, and I'll assign this to ETH11. And I've just sped up this little video to, to make it a little bit quicker, but it's gonna match fairly closely the priority def definitions as the download, but I have a smaller upload than I do download, so I'll have smaller values that you can define uh, for those uploads. Right? So I was going to say, you're impressive. That was fast as you were clicking there. That was me. I've had a lot of caffeine, and now this is slowing me down. So, anyway. <laughs> yeah, so my Gator beer. Andy Gator. You never had Andy Gator? I think it's a yeah. Louisiana beer. Uh, uh, people of Louisiana or wherever Andy Gator is from is probably going to be shouting at me, but it's really good. Okay, so I've created the profiles. Uh, I've assigned them to my e interfaces for egress, and now I'm going to create a report that I can then call upon later to see on a historical basis from the previous day which source addresses were B hogs. Okay, and the structure of the report uh, is very flexible. I'm going to use the detailed traffic log instead of the summary logs. And then I'm gonna go ahead and assign, uh, I make it scheduled so it runs every morning at 2 a.m. by default. I put in my filter string so that we're identifying hosts that go above a gig. And then I'm just gonna add all of the different uh, data elements that I want to appear in my report. So primarily I'll be looking at uh, source address, application, source user, and then destination address, destination port, and then the byte counts, both the total byte counts as well as byte sent and bytes received, because it could mean something if you see someone uh, uploading a bunch of information to some foreign country that maybe you don't normally do business with. So why is that going on? Maybe you need to create some security policy rules to prevent some of that behavior, but this is a great way to see you know, the differences of up versus download. All right, so this is what it would look like. I I've got my scheduled report I've created, and then when I wanna go see the output of this, uh, you can see here, in, in this example, I've got a bunch of unknown TCP, which is scary because that means the firewall is not inspecting that type of traffic for threats. And you can see that there's been a, a lot of data transfer, you know, 31 gigs, 38 gigs in several cases, uh, back and forth. So these are things I'd want to dig into. But notice that bottom one. That bottom one's scary. Open VPN traffic to Hong Kong. Oh, you, yeah. What do you what think that, that may be? Yeah. Well, do you what have do you, a webcam or something? Ah, in this case, no. It's, it's not a webcam, but it is a privacy VPN. Oh, and yes. And a lot of those use open VPN under the hood. Now, we do have in uh, app IDs in the Palatal Networks firewall to identify things like private internet access, which is a privacy VPN, uh, Viper VPN. I believe there's one now for Nord VPN. But if we don't have a specific app ID for the various privacy VPNs, there is one called OpenVPN, which may be legitimate, but if you guys know that you're a Palo Alto Network shop and you use Global Protect, there's a separate app ID for that. So why do you have a user do an OpenVPN traffic out to some destination that you don't do business with? I think that's exfiltration. Now, if you look at it, they've only sent 764 megs of traffic, but received 10 gigs down. So maybe the exfiltration isn't the biggest concern here. I probably have a user that's downloading 
and I'll just leave it at that, right? Right, right. So when you run this report, if you want to email it, the output doesn't have the pretty little graphics like the bars and everything, but you do get the numerical values which represent the same, same data, all right? So now we're going to create a script, and I'm going to use Pan Python. First of all, I'm going to show you how this one source address was categorized as a BHOG, and you can see them matched in that dynamic address group. So for a script to work against the XML API, you've got to give it a credential. I'm going to create a custom role that has no access to the web UI, has no access to the firewall CLI, and has limited access to just the XML API. Least privilege is important here. So, I'm so gonna this... Yeah. So, so if you don't mind me interrupting, you, so this script is going to clean up uh, what the lo uh, the log forwarding profile did earlier in the day. Is that right? Correct. So the log forwarding profile assigns the tag and then puts that source IP into the dynamic address group. So my script is going to remove that tag, releasing that IP address back into the uh, open, you know, or unclassified QoS class, so that that host can generate, you know, full speed traffic for the next day until they go over the threshold again, in which case they get dropped back to the, the quarantine or the, the throttle uh, dynamic address group. So the only problem with this would be is if they go over that threshold in the morning, then they would be under those guys, you know, in that. For the rest of the day. Restri yeah, restricted group the rest of the day. It could be a pretty severe punishment, but I guarantee your <laughs> users will learn fast not to... <laughs> Uh, you know, do a whole bunch of downloading or watch a bunch of Netflix while they're at the office. Uh, so something to think about there. All right, so what I've done here is I'm using uh, uh, Pan Python. You invoke it using Panx API. I just took and logged into the firewall and I stored the API key for my API username into a file and I locked it down so that only the, the creator of the file has the ability to read it. And now I'm gonna create uh, another file called clearbhogs.xml. And so this is going to work against the user ID features of the firewall. So I'm simply pasting in, uh, you know, the, the clear registered IP tags. Uh, and so you can see there, there's update and then clear and then registered IP. And you guys are welcome to copy my, my little XML file here. Uh, then I ran it and you saw it came back and said success. So when I go view the dynamic address group, first the name was there, the IP address was there. Afterwards, it was removed. So it takes a second for the, uh, the command to execute on the firewall. And then I'm just going to create a script that's going to call my Panex API. And I'm going to set it to be executable such that I could then invoke it using crontab or something else. And then uh, that's really it. Once you've, done, you've run that, you're now removing those tags and, uh, and your users come out of quarantine. So it's, it's a... This idea came to me, I was teaching a class a few weeks ago and a student was telling me that they've seen a lot of data transfers from certain users and they felt that the app IDs associated weren't necessarily business related and they wanted to know how to identify those users and really put the brakes on them and then remove it after a period of time. Now I had to use the script to remove that. The only other way uh, to, well there's a couple other ways. I could use a CLI command, there's a debug command to remove those tags. Or if, if you didn't notice, in the log forwarding profile, when I added the auto tag setting, there's also a remove tag. So there's add tag, which I use, and there's a remove option as well. I didn't use the remove because I'd have to generate another log event that would then invoke that remove action. And I could have looked for a log event like the user logged in in the morning, which would have then removed the tag. Uh, or I could have looked for some daily event that the firewall generated traffic to, let's say, the update server every morning that I could have built it around. But to be honest, I wanted a little bit more control instead of leaving it down to the possibility that a certain event would occur. So this is where I went the script route. And this gives you great flexibility. I'm a big advocate for using the XML API. It's not hard. And what I'm gonna put in the, the description for this episode our links to our API labs that we've got hosted for to teach people how to use the XML API and, and do just tons of awesome stuff with it. So uh, that's gonna be the, the focus of future videos for me for, for quite some time because it is so effective. And I wanna show you just how well this works, all right? So I'm gonna jump out here. And what I've got is this client, 
and I'm, he's connected to an FTP server and I'm just gonna generate some traffic. But before I do, let's go look at my firewall and let's see if anyone is registered in that dynamic address group at all. And here you can see, you know, for this dynamic address group called BHOGS, there are zero members that belong to it, right? So no one's been tagged. Uh, next, what I'm gonna do is go back to FileZilla and I'm gonna move this CentOS ISO over and I'm just gonna watch the byte count. Once I go over one gig, I'm gonna kill the session, which then generates the historical log. Then the log forwarding profile will uh, kick in and tag this source IP address as a BHOG. And then he'll show up in the dynamic address group called BHOGs, right? So we'll give it just a second. Uh, while we do, take a drink. Take a drink. Getting there halfway. All right, so I might have put a little too much vodka in this one because it stings the nostrils. You're not supposed to drink it with your nose. Isn't it wasabi or, you know, like wasabi? Doesn't that help to drink it with your nose? Don't I taste it more if it goes through my nose first? Yes. yes. <laughs> All right. Good way to get rid of a cold, right? There you go. It's, it's the neti pot. Take, take advice. There's an opportunity there. Okay, um, so I'm going to stop this now. Stop and remove all, and I'll close the connection to the server. And then we'll go check in my firewall, looking up here at the traffic log. Perfect. So here we are, I just got a log entry, that FTP, and then let's go see if my host was added to the dynamic address group. And I'll just refresh this command. Oh, takes it a second. There he is. So here you can see that host, 192.168.1.52, is now in that dynamic address group. So, and it's subject now to those QoS policies exactly. that you created. Yes, so do you remember what class I assigned the, the BHOGs? The BHOGs, um, class seven? Very good memory, my friend. All right, so watch this. I'm gonna reconnect, and I'm gonna just drag this CentOS over one more time, and notice the speed is super uh, slow. That's and brilliant. Yeah, one thing I love about the firewall is the feedback, right? So I could go run a report right now and this host would show up there, but on the network tab under QoS, I've got my uh, download interface and my upload interface. So since I'm downloading from that FTP server, I can go view the statistics and I love making it bigger and expanding the default group. And here you can see there's a hard cap on uh, class seven, so it's, only allowed to have one megabit. I'm using that full one megabit. And you can see this really stark line saying that host is limited to that amount of traffic. So it's instituted just like that. And so what's, uh, so a lot of people haven't actually seen this. I imagine that are watching this this first time they've seen, they, they may not even know that this view was even in the firewall. So can you click on the applications tab and look at the, oh, yeah, oh where yeah. you were? So the first thing, if you didn't catch it, you view it over here under statistics. Now, statistics is a convention we use in several places, like for log collector groups, or sorry, log collectors, uh, routing uh, instances, virtual routers, you can go see the dynamic routing table as it exists now. So this statistics, keep your eye out for those because there's often really great information you can see there. And you're right, so if I wanted to come down here and, and just sort by class seven, then the graph is now only gonna draw class seven and I could click through and see that there's FTP app ID and FTP data app ID that have been seen. And the data one is the one that's really hogging up the, the traffic. And I can see if I have user ID implemented, it'll show me the username of the user, uh, which security rule is allowing the traffic, and which QoS rule is permitting or is throttling this traffic. Now this, is, this goes back to what you said at the very beginning of, our, uh, of, the, of the show here, and that is, Okay, what about the um, security feature, or, or is QoS a security feature? And you mentioned that um, not directly, but indirectly in the sense that it gives you visibility. So this is the visibility, right? So, I mean, the fact that you can see the application, you can see the source user, you can see the security rule. I mean, all of that information then, um, can you know can result in some sort of additional action taken, some mitigation, that kind of thing. So that's that's very very powerful. Absolutely. And so and since I created that custom report that also used that filter string, this functions as one of those visibility aspects too. 
So I'm on the monitor tab down, down under reports and my custom report is here. And you can see, you know, source IP, app ID, and then the, the transfer amounts uh, that, that, you know, cause this person to be, or this IP address to be a BHOG in the first place. So I, I love creating the report, you know, marrying that with what I see under the QoS statistics for confirmation. Now this report is generated every morning at 2 a.m. by default, but I could always just come back up here to my custom reports, open him up, and run it right now based on the data the firewall has available to it as of that moment. What I've got now is I, I wanna show you some friends of mine who've benefited from this QoS implementation. Uh, so How has your QoS implementation affected your daily operations? It's great. Now I don't get calls complaining that SharePoint and Salesforce.com are slow. I was impressed how easy it was to identify different traffic and prioritize it. Of course, we in IT get unlimited access, but everything has to conform to the policy. Everything runs smoothly now, and we love it. I hear you don't like the new network speed limits. Can you tell us why? They suck. I can't download my games or movies using BitTorrent. Netflix and YouTube are super pixelated. Those network people think they're gods or something. Your network team has recently put speed limits on some troublesome network traffic. How has this affected your business? Very positively. I don't catch my workers streaming movies when they're supposed to be working. Productivity is way up and I couldn't be happier. So that's it. That's how you set up QoS and how you implement throttles and limits. Hopefully you guys thought that was cool. So it's that time in the show where Mitch and I like to share things that we've learned recently in the last week or so um, because it's learning happy hour. So I'm going to go first. Um, this book right here, Make It Stick. So I wanted to share uh, something with you. This is a great book called The Science of Successful Learning. So if you are preparing for an exam or you've got a student in your house, I would highly recommend this book because it will change your mind about the way we learn and you might you know a lot of us all of us have gone to school we all do you know we learn in this industry we're learning all the time but a lot of the things that we've learned in the past about learning is actually a myth right the, the way we learn so uh, i love this book because it really kind of illuminates and so one of the things in here that really stood out to me is they did a study on on uh, two different classrooms, or, 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 or two different methods, I should put it this way, two different um, ways of actually teaching uh, these history lessons. So it was the same teachers, same text, textbook, they did this study over three different semesters, and so they had two groups, and one group did uh, kind of, uh, they just did normal review, and they did no quizzes, and then they had the exams. And then the other group took a daily pop quiz, right? The group that did the best was the pop quiz group, and they were a whole letter grade greater than the group, than the other group. So um, Mitch and I like to do quizzes when we do learning happy hour. And one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of quizzes is because recall exercises is a powerful way that the brain encodes information. So that's why Mitch and I like to do quizzes and you can quiz yourself. You don't have, you wait for a practice test or anything. You can make your own. You can do flashcards and all this kind of stuff. So um, that's the thing that I learned. Uh, um, re, you know, I went back and I've been rereading this book and that really stood out to me. It's just the power of asking yourself questions. All right, Mitch, what did you learn recently? Well, thank you for that. Yeah, I think it's, it's spectacular, uh, the quiz aspect. And I think it's interesting that the, the pop quiz, I guess it's because the students knew they had a quiz coming up, so they focused harder or studied harder. Uh, genius. And, and we're going to start doing that, actually, with uh, these episodes. So you guys be ready for the quizzes, the pop quizzes that are inevitably coming. Uh, so my thing I learned recently, I think this is really interesting. I like researching attacks and breaches. And so I went looking for, you know, what was the very first ransomware attack? And uh, like almost all of them, they're entertaining, right? Especially early on, because most of the time people didn't think about using computers and these new devices as a, a mechanism either to get back at someone or to accomplish some kind of uh, outcome. I'll just leave it at that. So this, this comes from Digital Gardening. I'll have the link to it at the bottom of the show. 
And I'm just going to read it because it's really, really interesting. So the very first known ransomware attack was initiated in 1989 by a professor, uh, or sorry, PhD, Joseph Pop, and he was an AIDS researcher. And the way he did this attack, this is actually before widespread adoption of, of the internet, at least ubiquitously everywhere amongst healthcare systems. And so he created 20,000 floppy disks and labeled them AIDS research and included a lot of legitimate AIDS research that included, you know, 90 countries worth of, uh, of, of research. And he sent them out to almost just as many countries. And he said that these disks contain a program that analyzed an individual's risk of acquiring AIDS through the use of a questionnaire. And so naturally, people were very, very interested in this. But what he didn't tell them was the disks contained malware. And what the program did, the malware, it would wait it sat silently, dormant, under the covers until the system, the computer, had been power cycled 90 times. Like, that is the longest time bomb other than Michelangelo's birthday I've heard of uh, to make sure that it was, it was uh, not immediately discovered and then word got out that people should not install the disk or whatever, right? Well, it turns out that uh, once it, it attacked the system, there was a malware message or a ransomware message that was displayed demanding payment of $189 and then another payment of $378 just to, to use the, the software that he claimed to came with it, um, you know, or to continue using it. And it was called the AIDS Trojan or the PC Cyborg. Those two names are kind of used interchangeably. But I just thought that was really interesting how the, the attack vector was floppy disks and that it waited for 90 power cycles before it actually demanded the ransom. 20, 20,000 floppy disks? Yes. I, I think I would have wore out my floppy drive a long time ago trying to copy that many. I don't have a floppy drive anymore. But anyway, spectacular. I, I, hats off to that guy for the level of effort. Um, <laughs> I guess. Jail time for it. <laughs> Calluses oh, uh, with your fingers for flipping the little lock button. <laughs> you know, the little, the right. little, little lock. <laughs> oh, you're thinking five and a quarter. These were probably three and a half inch because it was 1980. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. The, but the still. Star Trek ones, right? <laughs> the save icon to the kids nowadays. It's not right. a flaw. It's just the save icon. So, hey, guys, uh, thank you so much for attending this episode and, and your attention and your focus. Uh, definitely take the quiz at the end of the show and stay tuned for our next episodes over there on the, the, the side of the window. We got the next set listed. Uh, tune in and also keep your eyes peeled for our live events, which are upcoming. Also join us, ask questions. Sometimes we'll be on location at a pub uh, and, and we'll let you know and you can come join us in person if you want. So uh, thanks so much for, for again, participating and, and definitely leave your comments and questions down below uh, or follow the links to the relevant sections within the live community and post your questions there. Thank you, everybody. You have a great weekend or weekday or whatever day it is that you're watching this. Cheers. <laughs>